Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CBI at 10. We've started this uh, wet, cold, bizarrely wintry May morning um, with the innocuous title of Where Next for Cash Flow and Finance? Um, I suspect that the answer is going to be in very different directions for very different businesses. Um, but I'm delighted that uh, Amanda Murphy at HSBC and Ian Watts from Marsh are joining us to try and help us understand the issues of debt, of uh, trade credit insurance that companies are really grappling with. I'm particularly delighted to see Rain Newton Smith, the CBI's chief economist. Rain, good morning. Um, I, I wonder whether before we sort of tuck into some of those more specific issues, you might help us talk through a little bit how you're seeing things on the macroeconomics and also a little on the politics, given the next stage of um, uh, the release from lockdown today. Do you want to start with the, the sort of the CBI's view on the choices that the government is making and what the implications are for business? Yeah, so I mean, James, maybe I'll start a little bit on on the reopening and and where we are with with the roadmap, and and then maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, the world outlook, the UK outlook, and and uh, and sort of where the UK economy. Uh, is in in all of that. So, uh, despite the well drizzle, I suppose I suppose in a good way uh, with the drizzle. The the good news on on the reopening uh, today is now we can do more things uh, indoors, which I think will be a bit of a uh, a lifesaver. Um, uh, so obviously pubs, cafes, restaurants can now serve people uh, indoors. Uh, I have to say I, I'm about to to book a table uh, for Thursday evening to to meet up with some friends. So I think everyone's really looking forward. Uh, to that. Uh, the other uh, big uh, restrictions that's being lifted is on international travel. But of course, there uh, we know a couple of things. First of all, it's still extremely restricted. So there's the list of um, those 12, there's only 12 countries on the green list. Uh, Portugal, the Faroe Islands is uh, uh, getting ready to throw open its doors, though, though obviously the doors are relatively small uh, in, in that case. So um, and I think what we do know is in terms of the uh, the world economic outlook is with the Indian variant, uh, obviously the humanitarian crisis we're seeing in India and in surrounding countries in Southeast Asia, uh, which unfortunately does echo what we have seen um, previously in this pandemic in uh, Brazil and in countries in, in South America, just reminds us that there are huge dark clouds, I think, hanging over the global uh, economic uh, recovery. So, uh, and we've seen here in the UK, there are pockets of that Indian variant, uh, which most scientific studies suggest it's more transmissible, not necessarily that it has worse outcomes for individuals, but it's that transmissibility uh, that I think have people concerned about whether we will be able to continue uh, with each stage of, of the roadmap, where the next date, of course, is on the, the 21st uh, of June. But I think, you know, it's great that the vaccine rollout here in the UK means that we are at the stage where we are able to to start to reopen uh, that. Though I think we all feel a little bit on, on tenterhooks in terms of where uh, those reviews will, will uh, get to. And I'm sure we'll come on to discuss that. Could James, you want to... Go on. I should ask you one thing, is that the, the messaging from government, if you're a citizen, is quite, let's be generous, textured, right? It's, you know, we are reopening, but be cautious. You get some people who are saying, be more cautious than the rules allow in terms of going indoors or meeting, greeting people. And particularly when it comes to travel, the messaging seems to be, more cautious than again the tiering system would allow for i just wondered in the conversations that the cbi is having with businesses is this becoming a point of frustration where the rules say one thing but the messaging around it says something if you like a little bit more constrictive and i wondered what kind of response you're getting from business on that I think the real sources of frustration uh, at the moment are partly, you know, definitely stem around the social distancing review. Uh, that is not uh, from June 21st. You know, the government had indicated that social distancing restrictions may be sort of fully lifted. Uh, there's now some uncertainty around that. But even now, we don't really know what the options are. Uh, and it has such a big impact on 
uh, you know, on businesses in different settings. So I think some of the things we're really getting in is obviously around hospitality. Yes, hospitality can open their doors, but social distancing measures are still in place. You can only, you know, meet in, in groups of either six from different households or, um, you know, one other uh, household. If there's lots of you at that those tables, there's restrictions uh, in terms of capacity. And of course, within hospitality, capacity volume, it's all about getting as many people in uh, and moving them along, you know, quickly having a great service, but being able to have lots of people in. That's how these businesses uh, are profitable. So I think there's big questions about how profitable they can be. And then another big source of frustration is I think office workers and uh, feel like the sort of forgotten army. We're definitely a lot of businesses understand that there has been this messaging about work from home while you can, but you know, uh, uh, you know, many of us haven't been back to our offices for many, many, many months. Uh, and that becomes increasingly difficult to uh, onboard new people, to be productive, to collaborate across teams and, uh, and, and to do some of the work effectively. And yet in on outwardly, the messaging around that, despite the fact that where we are with COVID is totally different now than it was back in January. And yet the messaging about going into the office hasn't changed at all. Uh, and businesses just really want more guidance around what that means in, in practice. So I think, you know, they really want that, that June 21st moment is really important. We've heard that on the 14th of June, we should get more uh, information on what that post June 21st looks like, but obviously that's really late for, for uh, businesses to, to plan. So I think that's definitely a source of frustration. And finally, on international travel, I think what I would say is something that is certainly on the forefront of, of my mind is that is a sector that we really need to help through uh, this crisis. If we are going to see restrictions on international travel, if we want to be a global trading nation connected in with the, the world economy, then we need to support that sector through the next few months if we're not able uh, to lift international travel. It, Rain, the, the odd thing is that all the things that you describe, I suppose we'd seen in the, we've seen probably since the turn of the year, you know, the, the strains and stresses in those particular sectors. I think we probably wouldn't have had quite such a bullish forecast for the economy as a whole. We wouldn't necessarily have been as confident as that, you know, you know, I'm sure you sort of thought about the things that Andy Haldane said last week around the outlook for the economy. Mm. What What's your read on the second half of 2021 and 2022? Well, look, I think, you know, we're in the challenging moment where I think actually, it, you know, for the UK, the UK economic outlook is looking really strong and, and it's consistently being revised up. So the Bank of England now expects the UK economy to grow by uh, seven and a quarter uh, percent, I think, particularly around unemployment as, as well. They now think unemployment will peak uh, at most at five and a half percent. And I know we'll probably go on to discuss it. I wouldn't be surprised if it peaks much lower, because actually what we're seeing is as hospitality venues open up and this is replicated across lots of different sectors, people are actually finding it hard to find the staff to reopen uh, properly. And that's telling you something about how businesses are adapting. And certainly when I talk to businesses across sectors and uh, in different regions in, in the UK, they're really feeling quite cautiously optimistic uh, on the UK. But it does feel like we're watching our back all the time. And and why is that? I think in terms of the global uh, recovery, you know, the world economy was set to see a really strong recovery this year. And I think it it still will do. Um, but what we do know is the risks now are much higher and people are very worried about what's happening in India and, uh, and Southeast Asia. And it just really reinforces some of the messages we had last week. We gathered uh, business leaders from across the B7, the G7 countries, uh, including as well South, South Korea, India, Australia. Um, and South Africa. And the real message there was, first of all, we are not out of this until the whole world is vaccinated. Yeah. You know, the idea that any, you know, we, we really have to stand together on this. And I think business having a strong message on that, that we need to have a global rollout of this vaccine and a global take up. Secondly, you know, falling into uh, protectionist measures. So, uh, you know, disrupting supply chains. Uh, really important that we make sure we are able to roll out that vaccine and we keep open supply chains to deliver that vaccine to people all around the world. And then 
opening up international travel will only happen if we share the data we need to do that around vaccinations, around testing, and having a clear and consistent way in which we can safely open up international travel. I think never have we seen a moment where we need more international uh, leadership. And I think businesses are, are prepared to step up. And I think there's a really strong message uh, for politicians in the G7 countries there as well. And Rain, I'm really struck by what you say about the forecast for the UK and the forecast for unemployment. You know, it's less than a year ago that credible people were talking about double digit you know, unemployment rates. You're talking about revised down from five and a half percent. But I just wondered whether or not your expectations of inflation and therefore interest rates are also changing. So interestingly, I think I see a little bit of a separation uh, b between the two. So I am much more worried about inflation now uh, than I was uh, a few months ago. I th I'm sure I, I feel like at the end of the year, um, last year, I was, uh, you know, on this webinar and, and saying, look, I'm much more worried about rising unemployment than I am about inflation. I have to say that balance in the UK is now really starting uh, to shift. We're seeing a incredible uh, levels of inflation in, in things like shipping. So, you know, shipping containers, the price of that going up by 600 uh, percent. We can see it in manufacturing, construction, supply chains, real pockets of very strong uh, inflation. I mean, I think more broadly, the hope is that supply will open up uh, to keep pace with a really strong demand. We know we're going to see over the UK economy so that we don't end up with inflation across the economy as out of control. But do I think the Bank of England should be you know, monitoring this like a hawk? Yes, I, I, I do. I don't think they're yet at the stage that they need to start increasing interest rates. But I think it's right that they start changing uh, their tone and they start saying, look, we are ready to act and they may well need to act much sooner than they expected a few months ago. Well, all right, Red. Well, listen. Uh, we, uh, I think this is one of those things, isn't it, which businesses, you know, had, had not worried about and are beginning to worry about. But it may be one of those things that we come back to in the course of certainly in the course of the summer and think about in more more depth. The, 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 the subject in front of us today is really those are those companies that are finding, for whatever reason, their access to finance is is proving hard at, at a time where things are still very uncertain. I'm, really glad that Amanda Murphy, who's the head of commercial banking at HSBC, and Ian Watts, who's the um, uh, the, the national practice lead at, at Marsh, can actually help us through this. So, Amanda, do, do you want to just describe what you see in terms of those people who are finding it easy to get the finance they need and those who aren't? Sure, thank you. You know, I think it, there's. you're right, there are some who are finding it easy, and over the last year we've got hundreds of thousands of small companies who borrowed for the very first time under one of the government schemes and and that's a whole new way of, of doing things so they're getting used to having debt many of them have kept that that money on deposit because they're keeping it for the really rainy days and um, but many have needed it as a lifeline in the last year and now i think some of those companies are coming back looking for additional monies to help support them through this time and the government have more schemes out there they're different to the ones last year so there is a confusion amongst businesses as to how to apply as to what are the eligibility criteria there's a confusion often is it a grant or is it a loan do i have to pay it back and i think you know all the banks are signposting as best they can to companies what what uh, information is needed how those assessments will take place but i think until we really get through and embed the loan schemes it's a really difficult time for many businesses out there and amanda will you just talk us through the difference pay as you grow how that's working the recovery loan schemes and any forbearance on the siebels on the coronavirus business interruption loan schemes how all of those different schemes actually work yeah, and without going into too much detail and losing half the audience here, you know, if I look at, at the recovery loan scheme, which is the most recent one the government has launched, the key difference between that and the bounce back loans, which we had before, is that the bounce back loans, the eligibility criteria was just really, are you a business that's been in operation and needs a loan? Um, there was no real affordability check and no about, do you have the ability to repay that loan? where the recovery loan scheme asks the banks to look at either the trading from financial year 2019 or from financial year 2020, or to look at the prediction for this year. Now, for most companies, particularly in, in, in sectors like hospitality, et cetera, uh, 
2020 was was really difficult so that's not a useful base so they're using their forecasting for 2021 which can be really hard to do rain mentioned about when do the rules change what happens in june 21st business are finding it really difficult to forecast and predict what the footfall will be like for the rest of this year so the, but the biggest difference is that assessment for the recovery loan scheme um, we've been at HSBC really clear. They're, the pricing is very keenly priced at 4.49 and 4.99, depending on the tenor of the loan. So it's a it's a good time for for companies that need borrowings either to stay alive or to expand to talk to their bank. Uh, then we look at pay as you grow, which is slightly different again, and that's looking at the government loan schemes that were available last year. And for those companies who are coming up to the first time to start repaying on that, giving them an option to either extend that payment uh, on an interest free and a capital repayment free uh, or, or to to move from a five year loan to a 10 year loan. And we're just starting to have those conversations because it's a the annual almost a year now since those loan schemes were introduced. So we're just starting to see companies come and talk to us about that. And again, that's another one that has lots of confusion because companies are not sure what to do. And as I said, hundreds of thousands of first time borrowers out there, lots of uncertainty. And, and you know, if there are businesses like that, please do come and talk to us because there are plenty of people there who do want to help. Amanda, thanks. I'm gonna just bring Ian in on the different end of this, Ian. Trade credit insurance. I think the, the CBI would say to you, actually there are quite a lot of its members who are saying they're having trouble getting extensions to trade credit insurance. Can you explain why that is? Well, it's it's a very long story. So the, there was state support for trade credit insurers, which goes back to uh, May, June 2020. So there's a lot of lobbying done by credit insurers to enable them to get state support to continue cover that they were writing uh, prior to the pandemic. So we're now facing a bit of a crunch now in certain sectors. So in most sectors, the performance of uh, the, the numbers of insolvencies have been relatively low compared to prior years. In fact, the state has done very well out of credit insurance as the premiums were mostly ceded to the state and the insurers possibly a little bit reluctant to continue with a scheme like that. So we're now having a time where sectors are opening up, the scheme is due to end at the end of June, and those sectors were, that were most deeply affected where the financials performance of those sectors during that time have been most uh, difficult, um, they're now opening up and the credit insurers are less inclined to support mm. continued cover. So the state scheme is expiring at the very time that those sectors, hospitality, travel, are in most need of that, of that, of that uh, support. And, and in a sense, if you look at it clearly, credit insurance doesn't mean you can't trade with a counterparty. It just means it inhibits the cash flow, the liquidity of, of the businesses. So you might reduce payment terms, you might ask for collateral, you might sell less product. So all these things play into that whole cash flow squeeze that's building up in certain sectors. And in, in those two sectors particularly, trade credit insurance is more prevalent, whereas in some other sectors which were supported, then uh, credit insurance is less widely used. So we are and, heading for a bit of a crunch at this moment. And, and Ian, so forgive me, as you might guess, this is not my mastermind subject, but it, it seems odd that on the one hand, you've got what Rain's describing, which is pent up demand, new lease of life in the economy, not least in the hospitality sector, and at the same time, a credit insurance sector that is reluctant to provide cover to exactly those industries as they're opening up. So, so can you explain why? For, for the very reason that uh, credit insurers will look at certain sets of data to make decisions about whether the risk is viable or not. And if you look at that, those data sets for hospitality, travel, leisure, over the last 12 months, they are going to be truly awful. There will have been no trade whatsoever. They will have burnt through cash. So they're coming to the insurance market at the very time when the financials are the weakest ever. So when you look at it logically, despite the fact that there is uh, there are there are there are loans still uh, out there and still available and still being paid back over a period of time, they simply cannot justify why they would continue to grant credit when the cash flow position is so weak. So the important factor going forward is transparency, is about openness, about modelling and sharing data with those stakeholders which are crucial to the survival of the business. Because in black and white terms, if you look at a balance sheet or a pub chain for 12 months, it's not going to be in great shape. And Ian, if you're if you are a let's say you are a pub chain and you're going and you're looking for the for an extension of your cover beyond June, 
what happens if you, if you go to your insurer and you say, look, this is crazy. We don't need to look at the 2020 numbers because we all know that they were had no bearing on the underlying business. Let's look back at the 2019 numbers. Will you get a hearing for that? Is that feasible? I, I think there's there's a great willingness on, on the part of the insurers to listen, to understand, to empathise, to try and analyse uh, information in a, in a different way. But it really needs a, a closeness, a real engagement on behalf of all stakeholders to make it work. And that's a big shift. So if you've got an organisation that was basing on metrics from DMB or from financials, all of a sudden you're switching into really detailed analysis of the trends and modelling of the, the particular counterparty mm -hmm. going forward. And that's really difficult to do because you need to do it on a week by week basis almost, because things are going to change so quickly. It might be okay this week, the, the, the sort of the, the, the footfall through a particular, particular chain may be substantial, but next week there could be a shift in that. So it's going to be very delicate, it's a very delicate balance to achieve. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we lobby on behalf of all firms to try and get the maximum coverage you can possibly get, but the reality is it's not particularly easy to do. Ian, thanks. Amanda, can I put to you, one of the great things about these CBI webinars is that you go very quickly from the the, the macro and the big picture to the very specific, and a number of people who have joined us today have got sort of specific questions, so I hope uh, I can put a few of those to you. W one of them is around was around mortgage holidays, and there's a, a question was whether or not it was always the plan that banks would reschedule mortgages after the mortgage holiday to have the same original end date, thereby significantly increasing the monthly repayments. My understanding on the mortgage holiday was the opposite. It was going to be an extension for three months at the end of the term of the mortgage. So I just wonder whether you'd clear that up. Yeah, James, unfortunately, not my mastermind subject either, uh, that the retail side of the business, the personal side. But my understanding was the same as yours, that the mortgage holidays were to enable people to have more time to pay, enable people to get through the cash crunch. So whether it's a misinterpretation or, or there's some different policy in place in a particular bank, I'm not sure. I would encourage whoever's looking at that, come and talk to their bank, ask that question. Oh, oh, all right, well, thank you. Here's some, here's some which, just this one, sorry, this one's more complicated, but I think is in your um, uh, part of the business. So David Crichton Miller asked, what is the substantive difference between the affordability test under the RLS, under the recovery loan scheme, and a bank's normal credit process? So very little difference. The, probably the difference, uh, if I was to highlight two, one is that, certainly speaking for our bank, there is a knowledge that looking at last year's statements, as you've already alluded to, James, they're not representative of what was to come. They're not a good example. So there's more flexibility in trying to predict the future and working with customers <laughs> to predict the future than probably we if you roll the clock back 18 months. And the second is that the pricing of the recovery loan scheme takes into consideration the government guarantee for, for part of that loan scheme. Um, and so therefore it's of benefit, more benefit to the individual customer. But in terms of the affordability, that check to make sure the customer will, will be able to pay back is still there. It'll be there with all banks um, looking at that. So that's no different. I can ask you, I'm going to ask you, Amanda, and then you in too, which is this really stubborn issue of the last year, those sectors that are acutely affected and affected for, I guess, deeper and longer than others. I'll give you an example. Uh, one person has written in, Amanda, and said, as an HSBC customer, my relationship manager has been great, but, and you, <laughs> but there's no understanding of our position as an event management company. We've reached the borrowing limit set by HSBC, but we'll be prevented from viable operations until summer 2022. We've booked for the 22nd and 25th of June and July 2021, but that's now been put on hold pending the government's roadmap announcements on the 14th that, that Ray just mentioned. So we do not now qualify for any HSBC help as our file accounts for 2020, 2021 are so bad. No surprise, but there's zero allowance by HSBC. And I'm just wondering, how are you coping with those sectors that you can see are effectively closed by the government, but are not necessarily supported by yeah. loan scheme supports now? And the events company is one of those sectors that have been hit probably the hardest. 
uh, we in we should be looking at what the possible future looks like rather than what last year looks like in this instance and it, it doesn't sound like it's happened so if, if anybody wants to drop me a note after this i'm very happy to look into the specific scheme but typically we are working to say if things get back to normal what does it look like or what does a new normal look like for these companies and how can we get back and more debt is not always the answer unfortunately because you'll have some businesses that are burdened with too much debt and that strangles them in the future but our, our ambition has always been to try to keep the doors open and keep the companies moving forward and alive until lockdown lifts and that's been really key and I'm, and I'm pleased to say we've managed to do that uh, from, from many, many companies, but happy to look at the specific instance again. And, and well, interesting in, in these in sectors, it's not just James. I just want to interrupt you just because I'm just sort of struck by how difficult that situation might, must be for Clifford Stone Street who, 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 who wrote this position and said, you know, they can't use the RLS because the accounts are bad for 2020 and 2021. If you're saying, look, the answer they is- can. But they, oh, sorry. But they can't, James. They can't. The, the RLS is not just based on last year's. It's also based on what's to come. So if last year doesn't work, which it won't for an events company, the RLS allows banks to look at what the potential is in the future. Huh. Okay. Okay. Well, that's really helpful. In which case, I, I would suggest that um, Clifford Stone Street, who's written this in, should probably get in touch with you because he actually wrote an additional note in the chat, Amanda, just to say that they'll actually struggle to do that and, and not being able to use the RLS. So if that's available to them, that'll be potentially quite significant. Yep. But, Ian, can I, can, I, can I ask you a sort of similar question, which is what happens if you are a company, <coughs> excuse me, that finds that their trade credit insurance is not going to be extended? What, what are the options that are available to you? Well, I mean, the options available to a debtor, so that it's the supplier that takes out the credit insurance usually, so the debtors are, the, the, the insured part is under the insurance. So the options available to the supplier simply would be that you ask, will you reduce payment terms, you reduce them from 30 to 15 days, you might reduce supplies, you might ask for collateral, all those things create that squeeze on the cash flow of the buyer. So it's kind of a catch-22. What, what it's going to take is a cohesive effort of financial institutions, uh, credit insurers, suppliers, buyers, in terms of creating an environment whereby there is really clear transparency and some support. I think that the issue that we're going to face going forwards in the sectors most deeply affected is that there may be no state support in terms of the, the, the liquidity, the, the, credit, the credit piece. We've seen already in Germany, the scheme there will not continue past uh, July 1. Likewise in, in, in Denmark, and probably that's going to follow its follow in, in similar markets across Europe. And the UK, while it won't be shackled by the, 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 the EU regulatory environment that, that caused delays in the first place, is going to make decisions and it may be conceived as state aid for certain sectors, which is not going to be that viable a proposition. Mm -hmm. But it, it's going to take a great deal of understanding from those stakeholders, whether it's insurers or banks, to enable that liquidity to, to continue. And also, the, what we do see is that that the buyers seem to be a little bit reluctant to share data and I think if they do share data it's not going to make it any worse but it could make it a bit better um, so performance modeling trends footfall because it's it's credit insurance isn't it's not going to stop people doing business but it just inhibits and if it inhibits it affects cash flow and and is, it, is there a world in which one person's written in and asked a question about whether or not the lending criteria might change here, whether or not, you know, it's necessary that, that lenders will be looking at assets, lenders be looking at property and instead looking perhaps perhaps at future performance. It, 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 are there ways of factoring, bringing in different factors that, ease, that, that make some finance more easily available? I think on the credit side, that those factors would already be being considered. So you're looking at a balance sheet, you already take those into account. But the, 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 real, the real issue is going to be in terms of cash burn. And if there's a way of projecting the, the, your cash flow, then you will get a better hearing from insurers who, will, who then become stake, stakeholders of some degree within your, within your business. Because they free up unsecured credit. And unsecured credit makes the world go round. That, that's, cool. that's how it yeah. Rain, Rain, can I just ask you about this? I, I'm just interested to know, this feels like it's a bit of a Groundhog Day moment, this, isn't it? Because in the in the lockdown, 
there was this same issue about some businesses when we were discussing closing do you remember in the sort of spring summer of last mm -hmm. year some businesses being very severely affected some businesses not and perhaps inevitably in reopening we're seeing something similar i just wonder when you talk to treasury bank of england cbi whether there's any change in if you like the the approach towards horizontal policy making let's do policy making for the whole of the economy and more of a thinking about how you do sector specific support for the next six to 12 months for those businesses that are just going to find it much more difficult to reopen yeah i think it it is absolutely in uh, thinking about sector specific support but also what i would say is support targeted at firms in distress right because i think what we know from all the work we've done is that you really have to drill down in you know within those sectors if you take a, a hospitality businesses you know some pubs if you're only serving drinks and you you're going to have found the last a uh, few months incredibly difficult whereas some have been able to at least have some income uh, coming in by using takeaways etc et so um, I think it's and, and also we know the whole issue around supply chains right we we do tend to focus understandably on the shop front on the you know the the end of the supply chain where you're interacting with uh, those customers but we know there are businesses in supply chains that fee you know that supply hospitality or the wait wedding caterers right um, you know they haven't had a, an outlet for their services for many many months now um, and so I think what we want to see is is uh, policies focused on specific sectors, but businesses within those sectors. And I suppose our sort of message is, I think, to businesses is don't delay the conversations. Do get in touch with your finance uh, providers, your banks. Uh, look, uh, you know, because I think what we're seeing is it's it's sort of crunch time for some of these businesses. It's when you're seeing rent mor moratoriums, tax uh, deferrals, et cetera, all of that coming to an end. So have that conversation early. Secondly, I think do one of the things that businesses don't always realize is there are tools they can use. So HMRC have time to pay, which means if you are in financial distress, you can have a conversation with HMRC about when you pay your tax liabilities. Because ultimately, mm -hmm. if a business goes under, then HMRC is going to get no revenue uh, in the door. So it's in their interest to have that conversation uh, with businesses. And we know HMRC have been receptive to it. But it's also why we've pushed very hard for some of those, those things that help ease cash flow, like uh, VAT deferrals. So I think do have that conversation as well with uh, HMRC and get in touch with us if you're not having any joy with some of those conversations. Um, and I think, I you know, we're... Great. Yes. So kind of just, just one thing, sorry, forgive me for interrupting, but, no, but one person, as you were talking, was, was talking specifically about this supply chain issue and, uh, and the extent to which, you know, yeah. supply chains, businesses in particular have been struck. What, what they wrote in the note was, of course, that large companies have typically found it easier to secure financing, the, certainly more than SMEs. And I just wondered, A, whether or not that's borne out by what you're seeing at the CBI, whether it's SMEs who are coming to you saying, look, we're struggling to get access to the finance that we need. And if so, what the CBI is doing about it. So I think there's there's um, a few things. I mean, ab absolutely, that that is always going to be the case. When you're a larger company, you tend to have, you know, a first of all, you tend to go into the crisis with a stronger uh, balance sheet. You have a larger pool of assets that you can draw on. You, it's easier for you to prove you've been generally operating for longer. You've got a credit history that you can go and talk to your bank uh, about. So I think it is always more challenging for for smaller businesses, particularly younger businesses as well. It's also about the age of of the business. I think does matter. Um, so that is something we're particularly concerned about, and I think that's why we've seen. You know, that's why going back to the crisis, the bounce back loans were hugely uh, important and now having a next stage of COVID recovery loans is is really important. But we are very interested in hearing from SMEs who are finding it difficult because the other thing is it's bank finance isn't always the solution. Taking on more debt for a lot of SMEs, they just don't want to do it. Um, the other thing we've been working on is obviously around prompt payments. One of the things that we find with smaller businesses is they get squeezed. Uh, it's a lot easier for larger businesses to, to carry, you know, three months in between being paid. Um, and so we're really encouraging the good business pays campaign, making sure that larger businesses are paying their invoices on time as soon as possible, because that's a, a lifeline to many of the smaller uh, businesses. So I think um, 
and again, it also speaks to to have looking at trade credit insurance, making it easier, which can be particularly hard for smaller businesses to to get some of that uh, insurance uh, in place to to make sure they are being paid. Uh, you know, when when we do see uh, credit crunches in in different sectors, so. Um, it's absolutely something that's on our, our mind and we're interested in, in hearing on businesses on it. And again, thinking about how they, they talk to HMRC when they are uh, finding uh, themselves in a period of distress. Rain, thank you. Ian and Amanda, I just wanted to come to a, for a couple of concluding thoughts to you. Ian, first, just on, on the trade credit insurance issue, you know, I, the way you describe it, you really do feel for businesses that are just going to find their working lives that little bit more difficult in terms of reopening but but can i ask you is it is this going to be something that is going to be defining for certain companies i.e potentially puts them out of business or is this if you like a back to school problem which is that you know it's difficult the first few weeks of getting back up and running going to be hard but actually business will figure it out and then with it the, fin the financing that they need will come uh, on, on the heels of that kind of resolution what, what, what scale of problem we're we looking at here I, I, I don't think it's um, it, it's going to be sort of a, a defining moment for businesses because there's nothing to stop suppliers still <coughs> trading with their buyers it just will make it that much more difficult for them to get through what has been a really difficult time anyway so we're just making it more difficult for them to recover from it's been the most awful period of uh, the economy and, and, and social life ever so it would be great if there was additional bit of lobbying going on for state to support some of those sectors most deeply affected by this crisis and also lobbying of insurers because um, I think there are ways they can reinvent what they've done for those organisations where the balance sheet or the P&L are pre pretty poor. So, and is that happening? Is that happening? Is, is there some coordination between the insurers talking about setting new terms that would apply to all, so they could make some changes on this front? Yeah, I, I think um, in the conversations that we have with the sort of main carriers, Eula, or Traders and Copas, definitely that there's a will to try and get this right. But their commercial organisations themselves, they have to. They have to make money and what the, the, the concern on their side is going to be this delay in insolvencies that we've had for 12 months at some point it's going to come home to roost and at that point that commercial judgment they make about whether they take risk or don't take risk is going to be much more difficult for them to do so so i guess they're preparing the way for that now clearly a more liquidity created by credit insurance is going to be good for the recovery phase it's a question of what mechanisms we we can find to make that work and make it work more efficiently. But as I say, that's got to come from all sides of, of, the, of, of, the, uh, of the, the, the commercial arrangement, insurers, banks, suppliers, buyers, information agencies. It's going to be a piece of work to get it right, but it's one that we're all committed to, to uh, trying to get right as well. Ian, thank you. Uh, Amanda, likewise, I just wanted to get a kind of longer term picture from you. I think when the Siebel scheme, when the bounce back loan schemes, when all of the different financing schemes were rolled out, you know, this time nearly a year ago, one of the fears was, was that, that corporate Britain would find itself in the spring of 2021 under a blanket of debt. And that actually this would prove to be a bigger and longer term structural problem for investment in business and growth in the future. And I wonder how you look at the landscape of business and debt now? So it's a really interesting question because we touched on already, even within sectors, there's been different responses. Some sectors, even in hospitality, have moved online, they've changed their business model. We've seen some really good successes, even in subsectors. So one of the areas, and I've talked to a lot of customers recently, but one of the areas that they're saying is, is a problem for them is actually recruitment of staff that it, they can't get people. There's a study that shows in London alone, over 700,000 people who are foreign born left the city. Whether they come back, really interesting. Who knows whether everybody or, or smaller numbers. So the impact that has on the economy, we've seen in the US, McDonald's has increased pay in its corporates by 10% and asked the franchises to do something similar so they can recruit staff into their, their restaurants. So what does that mean? Does that mean higher wages? Does that mean better, more competition for staff? And that's something actually that's on many of the companies that I'm talking on their mind and how they 
recruit going forward. The the debt side of things have kind of been kicked down the road a little bit with the pay as you grow options. It's there's plenty of time for companies to manage that through as their company comes back and business starts to perform again. So I, I see less concern around debt. And um, there's a lot of pent up savings there. There's a lot of pent up even for companies who've taken loans. It's often still there in their deposit account. So as that comes back into the marketplace, we should see increased demand and that should play well. Um, I, I'm, we, we haven't yet seen the level of defaults we thought we would. So whether that comes through the summer, we, we, everybody's watching that very closely. Um, but not the problem that we probably thought it would be 12 months ago. And I think in that way, the government has acted well to give alternatives there. Well, but I just, James, if I may just say, yeah. For companies that are there today, and I know that some will be struggling really badly, I'll echo what Rain said. Go and talk to your bank. Talk early. The earlier you come in, the more help you can get, the, the better equipped we will be to be able to support you. So please do that. Amanda, thank you. And Rain, can I ask you just to finish up by, if you like, taking the logical follow on of Amanda's point about wage pressures, staff shortages. And, you know, you made the point that you're your, your balance of worries from unemployment to inflation had shifted a bit in the first few months of this mm. year. There's still a question about the relationship between inflation and interest rates. And I wondered whether you could just speak to that, what you think is the likely direction over the next 18, 24 months on, it, on interest rates. So I, I think we're still not likely to see any increase in interest rates uh, at the moment. We have to remember as well that the Bank of England have been pursuing a huge program of quantitative easing. So there's been a lot. They've been using lots of tools to support uh, the the wider economy. And despite the the pressures we're seeing in some areas of, of hiring, and I, I think we have to see that as actually, you know, on one level that's a a positive sign that we are seeing that stronger demand in the economy. We're starting to see job creation, which is exactly what we were uh, aiming for. I think what the Bank of England have to be worried about is that turns into a generalised inflation spiral. I think we're still away from uh, away away from that being uh, a real risk across the wider economy. But but certainly I, something I hope the Bank of England uh, really have a look on. So I don't think we'll see an interest rate rise uh, this year. Um, you know, the bank, latest Bank of England monetary policy report didn't suggest that 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 would that was sort of on the cards. But I think we're going to start to see a, a more of a spectrum of, of views on this one. Um, and I guess our overall message would be, look, we are seeing stronger growth in the economy. We are in a really fortunate position, but we know there are pockets of distress and some businesses that are really going to still find the next few months challenging. And it's really vital that we support those so that we don't lose our ecosystem of smaller businesses and uh, and some of the supply chains we really need to see to be fully back up on our feet uh, in a year or two. Rain, thank you very much indeed. And, and Amanda Murphy from HSBC and Ian Watts from Marsh, thank you so much. It's been a fascinating and quite granular start to the to the week and the, the, the economy that we face. Rain, as ever, very good to see you. On Wednesday, CBI at 10 is back. Uh, Tony Danker, the um, uh, Director General of the CBI and Lord Woolley will be talking about uh, diversity uh, and um, uh, uh, in the workplace. And please do join us uh, for that at 10 o'clock. But for this morning, thank you very much indeed and have a very, very uh, good week.